It is on. There we go. Good morning. Welcome to Welling Church. Thank you so much for being here. If you would please stand and worship with us.
All right, good morning, good morning, church. Welcome to Wellen Evangelical Free Church. You are cordially and warmly invited um, to our Sunday morning service here. Uh, my name's Emmanuel. Um, I'm one of the deacons here. Um, and we're just, um, this is just a place where we can lift up the name of Jesus high because he is the highest name and he is the only name under heaven where men and women can be saved. So we thank you for joining us out of all the many churches that you could have um, come along to. You've chosen this one and we pray Lord, that we pray that it will be a wonderful time for you as you hear from God. Um, if you are new um, or you're not familiar with um, our church and, and its format, um, if you do need to use any of our facilities, you can go out around the backside and use the side entrance to use the ladies' toilets at the end of the corridor. Um, or and if you go into the back hall, um, you can also use the gents um, in, the, in the back hall. Um, and then um, also uh, as well, yeah, we just want to... Um, just let you know, feel free to, to use any of our facilities um, as you do wish. Um, so as we, um, this has been like an, an incredible week um, for our church. Um, our young people, um, you know, have, have really, they've they're finished their academic year. Um, and we're also just um, a church that's constantly um, reminded um, that God is working in our lives. Um, and he starts this work in our lives from the very beginning of our lives. And one of the ways that we try to do this as a church um, and, and to give God um, every opportunity to minister to the, to the young lives that he has entrusted us is to start with something like a crash, um, which is in the back hall here. Um, and then in the kitchen, we do have um, our toddlers. And then in the back hall, as I just mentioned, um, there's also the primary. And then the teens um, later on will go out for their final lesson of this academic year um, to hear from God um, one last time with Armand giving a wonderful lesson. Um, and um, as you will, um, if anyone's on the chat, WhatsApp group and you've had the pleasure of being in our WhatsApp group this week, um, you would have seen that the feed has descended into chaos as we went into our camp. Um, we had a camp last year um, uh, about five, six hours away from here and this year we, we, we stayed a bit more local um, and we did a mini camp um, and we posted loads of different updates in terms of all the activities um, that the kids did and we're going we're gonna to touch on what, um, what God has done um, with these young people and how God has changed their lives um, as well. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, so as, as I said before, God is working in all of our lives. And later on, um, we are going to feast um, in God's word. And we're going to look again at the kingdom years of the life of King David. Um, and as I was um, just thinking about this morning, um, I came across um, one of uh, my devotions this week, um, which was in Psalm 21. And this is just thinking about um, drinking from God's deep well of his holy word. And in Psalm 1, verse 1 to 2, it says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Um, but his delight is in the word of the Lord, and on his word he meditates day and night. And it just reads, it says, blessed, blessed indeed is the man who chooses to distance himself from the corrupting influences of, the sin -cursed, of this sin-cursed world. He does not heed the sinful advice and the philosophies of those who reject God, nor does he associate or emulate the lifestyles of those who wallow in their wicked desires. He refuses to align himself with those who mock and scorn the holy ways of God as found in his word. He finds his greatest joy and satisfaction in meditating upon the sacred scriptures, drinking deeply from the well of God's holy word day and night. He does not treat the divine teachings as a mere intellectual exercise, but allows the truth of scripture to guide his thinking, to penetrate his heart, and to transform his life. He understands that true blessedness is not found in the fleeting pleasures of the vain world, but in a vibrant, intimate relationship with Almighty God. By immersing himself in God's word and striving to guide his steps by scripture, he experiences the profound blessings of walking in the light of the Lord's presence, shielding from the darkness that ensnares those who reject him. He alone is truly wise and blessed, for he has chosen the narrow path that leads to eternal life. 
And in Psalm 60, in verse 11, it says, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So what I want us to do and think about today is just how we can um, just continually grow by just meditating on God's word. And we'll start off as we've done with singing these songs. Take them deep into your hearts as you worship God because you have chosen um, the path that leads to eternal life. And the only way that we can stay on that path and to keep walking is to drink deeply from the well of God's holy word. So as we sing these songs, um, I'm just going to pray and just meditate on that. And obviously, as we open up the scriptures later on, we'll see what God has in store for us. Um, So let us pray and then we'll sing. Um, Our dear Heavenly Father, um, we're so thankful um, for your holy word. It is a deep, deep well that we can continually um, drink from. And as we see from the the life of the Lord Jesus, he tells us that the drink that he gives us, we will never thirst again. Um, So Father, we just thank you that Jesus Christ is the head of this church and he is the one who we give our lives to and we submit to him and we obey his commands because that is the path that leads to eternal life so help us in these things help us as we worship you because you are seeking those who you who will worship in spirit and in truth and you have empowered us to do this so father we thank you for this opportunity to give you praise and give you glory and to fellowship as believers so in christ's name we pray amen Please stand up so we can sing together. Thank you. 
desire and I long to worship Thee. It's my prayer this morning that uh, that the words in all these songs would just resonate with your heart, that everything that we sing is something that you feel inside, and um, that you can focus on these words and take them with you through the rest of the week, and, um, and give God glory in everything.
Father, we thank you so much for bringing us all here safely today to worship together, to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Um, we know it could never be enough, but we want to surrender all that we have and give it to you, Lord, because you are so worthy. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Well, we got back from camp last night. Uh, we did three days of uh, church camp. We took a five-day camp, and we squeezed it into three, and uh, I think all the leaders feel it. Uh, a bit worn out in these things. But we had an absolute blast. We, um, through the course of camp, um, we studied the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, over 10 lessons. We had 10 Bible sessions where we studied every single verse in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And so what I would love is if you were a camper, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up and joining me on the stage, all the teens if you don't mind coming up. We took 29 students to camp this year, uh, which is amazing. 29 teenagers. They're all still alive, as you can see. Proof of life. Uh, no broken arms, no things of that. Uh, this year, camp was a little different in that we ran everything. And so I want to give a big thank you to all the leaders that came. They were the ones that made camp happen. Uh, and that was uh, for, for the ladies. We had Kylie and Emily. Uh, we had Sally and Carrie and Rachel uh, just doing a tremendous job in leading everything. And uh, for the guys, we had uh, Daniel and David taking the brunt of it upstairs trying to, to corral things in. Uh, we had Emmanuel and Armand uh, where there was no room left in the end and they had to keep driving back and forth every day because uh, we were so oversubscribed. Uh, we had Denitron uh, being a huge help. Uh, Michael came out, which was wonderful as well. Uh, we had uh, a lot of help from outside of that as well. Alice came and rescued us the night one and helped us cook a meal. Uh, Bola came out and helped us with a meal on Friday. And TK came out on Saturday. Uh, it took many people uh, to pull this off, uh, but very, very thankful uh, for these things. At camp, uh, very, very excited. Uh, Tammy, where are you hiding? He, he uh, um, repent of his sin, accepted Christ as his Savior. <laughs> High five. Thank you, sir. And I think all of us were very much challenged to get serious about our faith, to really take that to the next level as we work through 1 Thessalonians and these things. Uh, but before they sit down, I've asked Daniel if he doesn't mind coming up and giving just a quick uh, encouragement from the week. Thank you, Justin. I don't want to stand with my back to them. I've spent the week with them and I'm covered in bruises to prove that they're not trustworthy. Um, 
No, it was just really encouraging to see the way God was working in some of the young people's lives there. We had a couple of people who met with me and, and others to just to, to really talk about how God had spoken to them in the sessions and had led them to, to sort of see that there were areas of their lives that they'd yet to hand over to him. And so some people, you know, came to me and told me that they really wanted to give every aspect of their lives to Jesus. And it was such an encouragement to see. They really are wonderful kids, except at like two in the morning. They stopped being wonderful at that point. But um, it was incredibly moving as well every night to see them pray for each other. So every night, every one of the kids uh, took the opportunity to pray for someone else. And seeing them do that, and seeing the love that they had for each other, and the, uh, just the, the sort of joy that they had was incredibly moving. So, yeah, it was lovely. I'll keep it short because Pastor Tal's preaching today. So, you know, we'll be here a while. Um, but, yes, it was a wonderful week. And like I said, we, we looked at 1 Thessalonians and the fact that we have a bright future. Because of our faith in Jesus, we, we have an eternity in heaven. Uh, because Christ has promised to come back, which in every chapter in 1 Thessalonians we're reminded of Christ is coming back, we have hope. That, that, that there's a God who will not leave us or forsake us. Uh, and, and because of our relationship with God, we can have a love for one another that should encourage us all the more to continue uh, in, in this life. And um, that was our theme. All the kids walked away with the 10 lessons notes and these booklets. Some of them left them. It's going to be in the teen room for you to pick up in just a little bit. Uh, but I want uh, our church to continue to pray for them. Camp may be over, but um, God's work in their life is not. And I'm looking forward for them going back to school in September uh, a bit more strengthened and encouraged in their walk with Christ. I'm going to pray for them, and then we're going to dismiss them out of here because there's just too many uh, to, to keep uh, amongst us. But let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this camp. We thank you for uh, being able to, to get away from distractions and the busyness of life and focus on you uh, over the course of our 10 sessions of getting into the Word, looking at 1 Thessalonians recognizing that we have a bright future if we have a faith in Jesus, if we have hope in Jesus, and we have the love of Jesus shining through us. Lord, I pray for each and every one of these teens, uh, for those that, that knew you as Lord and Savior going into camp, um, that they would be strengthened to live better for you. We thank you so much for, for Tammy, uh, recognizing the importance of uh, repenting and, and, and asking Christ into his life. We pray this new relationship grows and flourishes in the years to come. And Lord, we really ask that what you began at camp would not end now that we're home, uh, but it would be a spark that would, would burst forth into a great flame and burn deep in each and every one of us. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, you guys can head on to the back. Armand's got a great lesson for you, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, for all the adults, try to find one of them and ask them what uh, God did in their life. I would love for all of them to uh, have a chance to share, but time does not allow, so find them. Uh, and then for parents, uh, an important thing for you to put down we're going to camp again next year, and that date is the 28th of July to the 1st of August. We're going to do five days, Monday to Friday, uh, for Camp 2025. And so if your kid went this year, please put those dates in your diary right now. Uh, we want everyone to, that went to camp to come back, and we want those who weren't able to be able to come next year. But we've already booked it, we've already paid the deposit, and we've got, instead of 34 beds, I think we have 57 beds for next year, and so I imagine I'll probably still be stuck sleeping in a tent, but that's all right uh, with me. Uh, so that is next year. Uh, for everyone still in here, please open uh, your Bibles this morning if you could. Uh, we're going to be uh, jumping back into 2 Samuel 13 as we continue our series uh, through the life of David. Uh, we're going to be 2 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to look at the first half this morning. If you need a Bible, raise your hand up nice and high. Call in Paul here, let you loan one. But otherwise, app open, your own Bible open. And uh, Melissa, if you don't mind coming up and reading for us this first half 
of 2 Samuel 13. Good morning, church. Um, okay, so I'll be reading 2 Samuel um, chapter 13 from verse 1 to 14. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Anam said, send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Anam said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she made and brought them into the chamber, and Anam, her brother, But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. She answered him, him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, would... And as for you, you would be as one of those outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate that. Um, All right, uh, so before we jump into uh, the sermon this morning, there's a few housekeeping things I kind of want to share with all of you. Uh, The first uh, thing is, especially if you're new here uh, and you've only been coming for a couple weeks, a couple months, you might be saying, uh, who am I? Uh, I get that a lot anyways from my own family, like, why are you here? Um, And so my name is Tarl. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I've been uh, one of the pastors here for uh, a couple of years now, me and Justin doing a lot of stuff. Uh, Our family, we uh, moved back uh, to the U.S. uh, last year, and uh, our plan is, God willing, my wife and I, we're going to come back uh, in a couple of years and um, settle here permanently, so we're really excited uh, about that. But there's a few things that we need to kind of tie up loose ends on our uh, neck of the woods before we come back uh, long term. And so um, I'm visiting here for the next couple of Sundays, and I'll be preaching here. And so if you can endure my preaching, thank you so much. Uh, please don't let that, you know, overshadow everything that's going on, because if you love Justin's preaching, he's going to be back in a couple of weeks, all right? But we got to give him a break, all right? Um, and so if you have any questions uh, for me and kind of future and all that sort of stuff, I'd love to share more about what God is doing in our life. We're really excited about how God is kind of opening up our ministry especially for these next couple of years, not just to be able to minister here, to minister in the U.S., but then to minister in other countries uh, around the world for the next couple of years. So we're really excited for what God has uh, for our family uh, ministry-wise, missions, uh, and also mobilizing and training up other uh, ministry workers around the world. So we're really excited about that. The second thing is uh, camp that's been going on. Uh, I'm just so impressed, so excited, so thankful for what God has done uh, with all of these teens, all of these kids. 
uh, this past week. Uh, but please don't let it end here. Uh, please pray for your kids. Please pray for the children of this church. Um, this is where it begins. This is where it starts. And uh, you need to fan into flame uh, that burden, that passion that God has laid upon your children here at this church. And we all need to be praying for them uh, because obviously uh, the world, the evil one, does not want uh, them to succeed and to grow in their spiritual walk. And so it really takes a village. It takes a church community uh, to be able to look out for each and every one of them. And uh, listen, if we don't take the onus, if we don't take the opportunity to invest in our kids and to take care of them, uh, guess who will? The world, you know? And, and the world would love nothing more than to derail their walk with God. So please, please get involved. Please encourage. And uh, also, you need to be praying for all the workers that got involved because they are wiped out. They're tired. Uh, Emmanuel is barely awake right now, all right? Uh, so please uh, just pray for them, help them, because they did a whole lot in preparing for that, um, and they just need your prayers. All right, so that's second bid, housekeeping. Third thing, uh, I'm not feeling well today. Um, I've, I've caught something. Every time I come back to England, I catch something. I don't know what's wrong with you people, all right? You are a sickly bunch, um, I feel like I'm half Native American, uh, and I feel like Pocahontas coming here. She died in her 20s visiting England, all right? She was fine in America. She comes for one visit, died. So uh, I'm not quite 20 anymore, uh, but uh, every time I come back, I'm catching something. And I know it's going around, uh, so just pray for me. I'm not feeling 100%. So if I'm not like super excited like I normally am, because you know, I, I'm normally jumping off the walls, it's because I'm not feeling well. Last thing, and then we'll jump into uh, the sermon today. Now, as we just read uh, from the passage um, this morning, we're dealing with some very disturbing material. Um, this is stuff that uh, I've been preparing for for the past couple of months and knowing I was going to be here, but it's something I haven't been looking forward to at all. Uh, this is some of the darkest, saddest, uh, awfulest stuff in all of uh, the Bible. I, I hate it, and I hate even having to talk about it uh, this morning. Uh, it's, it's really grotesque and awful. Um, but one of the things I think about, especially when the New Testament talks about the Old Testament, why do we study the Old Testament? Why do we look at these things? And yes, there's loads of reasons. Obviously, God's word and prophecy and prediction to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, where we have our faith, hope, and trust, where we can have joy and we can glory in him and his forgiveness upon all of us. But one of the things that we also know from the New Testament is that the Old Testament is there for our instruction. It's there for our example. And if we don't study these things and learn these things, um, as it said many, many times before, history repeats itself. And so we need to study and learn from it, warts and all, uh, seeing the good things in David's life, seeing the awful things in David's life and even his family to see how does that even apply to us as followers of God today. And so while this stuff is very disturbing and it's stuff that I'm not looking forward to, uh, we do need to examine it and see, well, what is God trying to share with us uh, this morning? If you have any questions about anything that we're discussing this morning, especially because of the nature of this material, uh, please come and talk to me or talk to uh, one of the pastors afterwards. We'd love to discuss more with you because uh, this is very difficult stuff uh, to get through. So let's, uh, by saying all of that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and really devote this time uh, to God and for his guidance upon our life. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and just the celebration and the time uh, that we can uh, lift you up uh, with song and with reading of your word and now for the preaching of your word. I pray that uh, in all these things that you will get the glory, that you will um, just be honored through all these things. We thank you for what you did over this past week uh, with all the teens and all the workers, Lord. I pray that uh, it will be a mutual blessing for everyone. One, that iron sharpens iron, not only for the teens, uh, but for the workers and us as recipients of the church, that we can be blessed uh, by it. I pray that you will keep your hand upon them, keep your hand upon all of the workers and upon Justin and upon everyone that guides and directs and helps set the pace uh, for the spiritual life of everyone here at this church, especially our children and that next generation that 
comes after us. Lord, I pray now as we look at your word, we know it's there for a purpose and a reason. Uh, and even though it may be difficult and hard for us to understand each and everything, uh, we know it's there for our instruction, our edification, and our example. And I just pray right now that through all these things that we can learn, grow, and thus be a better follower of you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, when Justin kind of uh, started or restarted the sermon series on David, every summer we've been talking uh, a little bit about David, and we're wrapping a lot of that up this summer uh, before we jump into something else in September. He opened up uh, m uh, part of his main uh, message uh, with a very interesting quote um, that uh, has uh, been passed along to us by a very famous a theologian. And one of the things uh, that Justin mentioned is this idea from this quote is that sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you'll want to pay. Uh, that quote, sin will take you farther than you'll want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want uh, to pay. What's interesting about that so many Sundays ago is that quote was from a very famous theologian that died in 2020. His name was Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias. Some of you guys are already kind of putting the things together. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ravi uh, was a Canadian, uh, uh, Indian, American uh, uh, theologian who was world famous. He started his own ministry. He worked with Billy Graham. He worked for over 40 years in the ministry. He wrote over 30 books. He went all around the world preaching the gospel. I was re-watching an interview uh, with him, an hour-long uh, interview uh, with a man named Ben Shapiro, and he has these long-form interviews for like an hour, hour and a half, and it just amazes me once again how incredibly intelligent and smart this man was. Just a genius, just to be able to pop off things just so eloquently and easily. And some of the things, even some people that uh, wanted to debate him and argue with him because he'd go to these formats to universities and discuss the meaning of life. He would talk about coherent worldviews uh, and how they, they'd need to uh, satisfactorily answer uh, major questions like origin, meaning of life, morality, and destiny. But shortly after he died, you know, that's when all these allegations pop up, you know, about his life and, and how, you know, he, he would travel the world and abuse women and how he owned um, spas and he would constantly get uh, massages and use this as a vehicle and opportunity to take advantage of women all around the world. It's shocking. And shortly after his death, his legacy is not one of celebration. His legacy is not one of saying, look what God did in this man's life. Uh, but now his whole ministry and his own children are having to apologize for what this man has done and completely devastates uh, the name and uh, the work of what he had done for years. It's shocking. And I think it's interesting and a little sad and a little ironic that this is the quote that we think about, that sin will uh, take you farther than you want to go and keep you there longer than you'll want to stay and cost you more than you'll want to pay. Coming from a man that knows all too well of what is going on in his life. But then we back up it a little bit and we think about how does a person get to this point? And we think about the idea and the very nature of sin, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But we think about sin by its very nature is a deceiver. It deceives us into thinking this will be the thing that will bring me joy and happiness and peace. This is the thing that I have to have because if I have these things, this sinfulness in my life, then it will make everything better. But what is the end of all those things? It's destruction. It's the very lie that the devil himself gave to Eve. 
that this is the thing that will make you better and whole. But in actuality, it just brings death and suffering. And so we're in 2 Samuel right now. And with 2 Samuel, we see the first couple chapters, the, you know, really the rise of David and how uh, he comes uh, to be king over all that is. But then with uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and the horrible mistake uh, that he makes because of that repercussions follow him for the rest of his life. And then the rebuke that we talked about last week from Nathan the prophet upon uh, David and saying that sin will come into his own house and this will follow him for the rest of his life. So the big thing that we want to talk about uh, today and what we're going to discuss over and over again as we go through these 22 verses and then, uh, of course, next week we're going to see the culmination of what happens to all of these uh, individuals. And so let me encourage you to come back next week so we can get all of these things in its proper uh, context. But what do we see? What we see is that unrestrained sin begets more sin. What we see is that when sin reigns in your life, it multiplies. When sin reigns in your life, it snowballs. Unbridled sin snowballs in our life. And what happens is these sinful desires fueled by sinful counsel will explode into sinful actions. And we see that in our own life, but we definitely see this in these verses that we're going to read. So if you could open up your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, whether in print from an old tree or you have it from a phone, electronic form, we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to go verse by verse through these things. Verse 1, now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. So we already introduced um, what's going on. Some time has passed now from the incidents of what happened in David and Bathsheba's life and the sin that he committed there. Some time has passed after a time. We don't know uh, definitively how much time, but we know some time has passed from all of these things. And now we see that Absalom and Tamar are uh, full sisters from uh, their, their mother, Makah, who was the daughter of a king in Gesher, which is kind of on the other side of the Golan uh, Heights. And so if you've been reading any of the news this past day or two, you know, the attack on Israel uh, there and all the fighting that goes on there, this is where uh, king, uh, the, the king of Gesher and Makah came from. And so David, being a polygamist and having multiple wives, this is the offspring uh, Absalom and Tamar of uh, th that union. But we know that, that they're not uh, the oldest. We know that there's an oldest from another uh, woman, uh, Hinoam, uh, named uh, Amnon. And Amnon is the oldest, and he's the heir apparent of the kingdom. Now, of course, we know that doesn't happen, uh, but this is how all of this is introduced. And we see this word described as love. You know, um, well, as, as we use it, even in the English language, many times in the Hebrew language, this word love is used in multiple instances. Sometimes it's used for a real self-sacrificing love, and other times it's used for a physical act. And sometimes it's used, as is here uh, in this instance, it's more of a, a strong desire, and especially in uh, Amnon's case, it's really lust, as we're going to see. Verse 2, and Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. So a lot in this, but one of the things that we know, especially in this culture and in this time, that uh, women, uh, especially uh, of this nature, were kept away uh, from any sort of single Men. It wasn't like uh, single men, you know, they, they just met and they just ran into each other. No, they, they were kept uh, as uh, uh, away from uh, that environment. But because of the relationship, the family relationship of uh, Absalom, Amnon, Tamar, uh, they were able to see each other. And Amnon was so tormented day and night 
for his love for his half-sister, it, it drove him mad. It drove him uh, ill because there was nothing he could do about it. Why? Well, first of all, because of the cultural nature of this, but also this was forbidden in the Bible. And we're going to look at this later, but in Leviticus, uh, you're not supposed to have anything to do physically, sexually, emotionally, uh, in this sort of instance with your half-sister. I mean, that kind of goes without saying today. That makes sense. But for them, uh, in their culture, how many times do they see people marrying their half-sister? It was very common in that time, but not in Israel. It was for Bidden. So we're going to stop off here and just kind of look at this, but one of the things that we want to think about is this idea of um, unrestrained sin begets more sin. Sinful desires left unchecked, what it does is it creates a toxic breeding ground for more sin. You see that sinful desires seek to break God's law. You know, our lives are no longer about serving God, but it's really about serving God ourselves. Our lives are no longer about honoring God, but it's about pleasing myself. It's about pleasing the flesh. Our sinful desires seek to feed the flesh instead of to honor God. And where does this come from? We know by nature we're sinful. It comes from our very sinful nature. And the problem with Amnon during this time being half sister or half brother to uh, Tamar is that he dwelled upon his sinful passion. He lived there. It drove him mad. Instead of saying, no, this is wrong, instead of saying no to this sinful desire and this sinful passion, knowing it's wrong, what does he do? He dwells upon it. And this really comes back to even today, you know, the common refrain from the culture around us is, if it feels good, then do it. I mean, isn't that what we hear all the time? If it feels good, do it. This is what our culture teaches to do. Hey, it's not harming anyone. It's, it, it's not for anyone. It's, it's okay to look. It's okay uh, to think about it. If it feels good, just go ahead and do it. The problem with that is this creates that toxic breeding ground from which everything else we're going to see in this chapter flow. You know, this reminds me of when I was in seminary, and I had a professor. His name was Professor Lingo. Justin knows who he is. Uh, he passed away, what, a couple of years ago? Uh, he used to be a missionary to uh, Columbia. And I remember it was my freshman year, uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't know any. I still don't know anything. Sorry, I thought I was going to, but no, I still don't know anything. Um, and so I'm there. And we're in class, and we're learning about ministry, and we're learning about all this. And he stops off, and he gives this story about what happened in his own life. And it was really shocking to me at the time. And I was a little bit judgy about it, just to be honest with you. Uh, but now that I'm older, and I, I, I've kind of seen these things, and I've been around people, and I've even gotten to know my own sinfulness, it's like, wow, you know, this guy was wise, This guy was serious, and he handled these things in a very serious nature. He was talking about how when he was uh, going around traveling to raise his partnerships and his funds to be able to go to Columbia. And, of course, this was years ago. I mean, this was like uh, in the Iron Ages. I think it was the 70s, you know, or maybe the early 80s. Um, He would travel around, and he'd be by himself a lot of the time. And uh, he went to go visit the church that he was going to speak at. And the pastor told him, hey, if you need anything, or if you're lonely, or if there's any sort of problem that comes up, issue, you know, come call me. Of course, that was before phones, mobiles, you know. It was like how to call the old-fashioned way with, you know, uh, smoke signals. And so um, he's like, sure. So he's telling the story to a group of 19, 20-year-old teens, uh, kids that are getting ready to go off into ministry. And he says he got onto the lift, and there was this beautiful woman right next to him. And this beautiful, and he's not a good-looking guy at all, all right? He actually had his eye pecked out by a rooster when he was like, what, like two or three? So, like, one eye's looking this way and everything's, you know, and I don't know which one to look at, you know? He's a really nice guy, though, really, really nice guy. But he was also very not attractive. 
And um, he said this beautiful woman was in the lift with him, and, he, and, the, and the woman started chatting him up, you know, and started talking to him, okay? And this is when he was a young man, and started inviting him to her room. And he didn't know what to do. He was like frozen. And he just remembered that this pastor said, hey, if you need a place to stay, if you need to talk to anyone, just, just call me and I'll come and get you. It's really kind of interesting how God's sovereignty is in all of these things. So he, as soon as he gets off the lift, uh, he goes, calls him up, and the pastor uh, picks up, he explains the situation, and he says, listen, I, I just, you know, I just want to uh, go above board. You know, I don't want to even uh, be in that situation to where I'm in my room by myself dwelling upon that. And as a young person, I think, man, what's wrong with this guy? You know, like, what's his issue? Why can't he handle himself? Why can't he control himself? Why does he have to go to the extreme to make a phone call, make himself appear weak, and get out of that situation? But then I think, what an incredibly wise move that is. To where he doesn't even want to entertain the possibility of something that he could do that was wrong. I think about, how, would we even do that in that same situation? Would we go that far? And I think about the verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed lest he fall. And, and I think Paul gets it. You know, Professor Lingo gets it. And how much more so do we need to get that? You know, I think about um, what happened with Amnon. If he would have taken heed, lest he falls. If he would have had that same sort of situation, not to dwell upon that sinful desire and passion. You know, we need to be careful not to act simply and solely upon our passions and feelings, but instead act according to God's word. We don't dwell upon sin. We dwell upon God's word. We need to take heed lest we fall. But let's carry, let's carry on. What do we see now in the next couple of verses? Something quite shocking. And it comes back to this idea of unbridled sin. It snowballs. Sinful desires fueled by sinful counsel. Fueled by sinful counsel. So let's look at verse 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. So just to try to explain a little bit of the family tree, okay? Jonadab obviously is the cousin of Amnon. So you have David. David had many brothers. One of those brothers was Shemaiah. Shemaiah had a son named Jonadab. And normally in the Bible, when we see this idea of crafty, it's, it's kind of given in a positive sense, you know, very skillful or wise. But what we see here is this is used in a negative sense. And I find it interesting in verse 5, or uh, verse 3, sorry, it says, but Amnon had a friend. You know, these five words would shape the rest of Amnon's life. These five words. Amnon had a friend. It makes me think, who are our friends? Who's your friend? Who is your friend in these scenarios? And we see that Jonadab did not have the best intentions for Amnon. Verse 4, it says, And he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So what do we see? Jonadab comes up with a plan to help him out, but not in a positive way, in a very sinful 
way. And what I find interesting is that Amnon would not have been able to do what he carried out and did had it not been for the counsel that he received. You know, our counsel helps determine our course. Our counsel helps determine our course. Here's my question for all of us today, is where do we get our counsel? Where does it come from? You know, we we see it, you know, coming even from the most innocent of people, you know, our own family members. We think, oh, I I should be able to trust them. They have my best interests in mind, but that's not always the case. Or our friends growing up, or even today, work colleagues, uh, they care for me, but do they? Where do we get our counsel from? Verse 6, so Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill, and when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. In all of this, this unrestrained sin, this unbridled sin, it just snowballs. It begets more sin. And what do we see from all of this is that our counsel helps determine our course. The problem is that we hear what we want to hear instead of what we should hear. You know, it becomes a little bit of an echo chamber for us. We get the counsel that we want. You know, it's like uh, we've all done this, you know. Uh, we, we want to get some advice from someone. We go to a trusted friend, someone that we know is wise, um, and we ask them, and what do they do? They give us counsel we don't like at all, right? We hate it. Uh, like, I, mm, okay, I see your point. And then what do you do? You go to someone else because you, you want to you wanna get the counsel that you want to hear. So you keep going to different people until you get the advice that you like instead of the, vi- the advice that you should get. You know, the sinful counsel of others can help fuel my temptations or help me fight it. They can help me fuel it or help me fight it. And this is why it's so important that we have to be careful of who we let advise us. Because we're always getting advice. We're always getting counsel on our very lives. And instead, we're hearing it from places and sources that are wrong, that are incorrect, that don't have our best intentions in mind. Going back to 1 Corinthians, Paul in uh, verse 15, uh, or sorry, chapter 15, verse 33, what does Paul say? He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. You know, this was a very common saying in Paul's day. He actually got it from uh, a Greek play from uh, Meander uh, named Theus, which I find interesting because uh, even unbelievers knew this happens. And why should we be shocked that if we're getting advice from wicked, deceitful, evil people, that's what we're going to get. And it's going to rub off on us. But instead, I always like the, the, the verse in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. It says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know, once again, not to put a little pitch in, a little commercial for our church, okay? Any godly, wonderful, Bible-believing church. But as a Christian, if you are a Christian, this is why it's so important to fellowship with other Christians. You know, uh, a Christian cannot, should not live on their own. We have to be with other Christians. Why? Because other Christians hopefully will exhort you, encourage you, advise you to live a godly life according to God's word. Why? Because what happens by the deceitfulness of sin? It hardens you. It hardens you to the very things of God. And then it allows you to do things that you never would have thought in your entire life. I love uh, the passage from Mark chapter 2. 
You know, it's a very familiar story uh, for many of us. Uh, You know, we have this paralytic man, you know, and Jesus has come back to his hometown in in, in Peter's hometown, Capernaum. And uh, Jesus has just gone around preaching all across Galilee, uh, healing people, doing all sorts of incredible things. And he comes back and, uh, and it says the house was so full of people as Jesus is teaching and, the, and uh, these four friends bring their paralytic. He can't walk. And they bring him to the house. And because it's so packed, what do they do? Anyone remember? I mean, they go through the roof, as any normal person would do. I mean, I just find that fascinating, where it's like, uh, it's packed. We're not going to wait. we got to get this done today. They're probably Americans, all right? <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm sorry. I don't want to get in trouble. I've been living there for a little while, so I'm I'm starting to get, yeah, there's a lot of, never mind. I better just shut up. Um, So they go through the roof, and they tear it all apart, and they lower this paralytic man. I love what verse 5 says about Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins be forgiven. Whose faith did Jesus see? His friends. His friends. Jesus was so amazed, so impressed by the faith of this man's friends that Jesus heals this guy. That should be a lesson for all of us. You know, um, Jesus uh, healed this man because of his friend's faith. This is why our circle of friends matters. Your friends and their influence matters. Your circle matters. And it comes back to that very, very old saying. We've heard it all before. If you show me your friends, there you go. I'll show you your future. I mean, this is why our friends matter. Who do you hang out with? Who are your friends? How do I know if they're my real friends or not? How do I know if they have my best interests in mind? Here, I'll give you a little test, okay? I'll give you a little help. You know, do they help me to be holy or do they help me to be sinful? That's how I know if they're my real friends or not. Do they help me to be holy or do they help me to be sinful? Are they giving me advice to break God's law or are they giving me counsel to do and honor what God wants me to do? Who are your friends? We come back to the ideas, they'll help me fight my temptations or help me fuel, fuel them. Okay, another commercial, I apologize, uh, and we're going to wrap this up uh, all really soon. But I'm amazed <clears throat> by the very idea of even showing up here at church. You know, they've done all sorts of statistics on how people normally show up at church. And it's like, you know, 2% of the people uh, show up, it's because of some sort of advertising. Or uh, 6% show up because of an organized visitation, you know, going out and talking to people, maybe on the high street. Uh, 6% actually come and show up because of a pastor invite, you know, uh, because the pastor goes out of their way. Uh, I don't invite anyone to church, so I don't know. That's not me at all. I'm teasing. Um, But 86%. 86% of people that normally show up to church, you know why they show up? Because a friend invited them. A friend invited them to church. You know, there's people all around you. You know, we've been talking about the negative side of this friendship circle, the negative side of this council. I just want to take a little bit of a break and think about, let's think about the positive side for a second. Think about the people that you can influence for good. Think about the people that you can influence in a good, positive, and holy way simply by inviting them to church. Think about the impact you can have upon someone's life for all eternity simply by saying, hey, why don't you come with me to church? It's really not that hard, you know? We have free coffee after church. I mean, that should bring anyone, right, Terry? That's, that's why you're here. People bring people. I invited Terry to come. I'm, I'm teasing. I didn't. He came on his own. All right. Let's carry on and let's get into the worst part of all this and then we're going to wrap all this up. This idea of sinful desires 
fueled by some full counsel. We see these go hand in hand, but now what does it explode into, sadly, sinful actions? Verse 7, then David sent home Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. You know, it never occurred to David in all of these things that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It never occurred to David that he should be suspicious of um, what uh, is going on here. Verse 8, so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked uh, cakes. So, you know, some sort of ancient sort of idea of a dumpling or something. In verse 9, and she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, send everyone away from me. So everyone went. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. You know, the Bible is going into a whole lot of detail about this incident, sharing all these things. And we know what's coming. And I almost want to be able to scream and say, don't. Verse 11, but when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said, come lie with me, my sister. We see the level of derangement, the level of disgust, the level of sin that he's willing to stoop to. And what does she say? No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. So she begins to explain all the reasons why this is wrong. And she pleads and says everything that she can possibly say and saying, this is not done in Israel. This is an abhorrent act. It violates God's law. Leviticus 18, 9 and verse 11 go into great detail of saying, this is what you do not do as a people of God. You do not do these things. It's forbidden. Verse 13, as for me, where would I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now therefore, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you starts to go into detail about the shame that this would bring, that he would be an outrageous fool. This is something that only uh, the most outrageous of fools would do. He's in line to be the very king of all of Israel, and now he's going to do this terrible, terrible sin. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, she violated her and lay with her. And then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated was greater than the love for which he had loved her. And Amnon said, get up and go. You know, this is such classic victim blaming. You know, he did this thing. He forced himself physically upon her. And now he hates her for it. And this is the thing that we see a lot of times with people. When they finally get what they want, they realize what they've done. They realize the level of sin that they've stooped to. And they've committed this outrageous and terrible thing. And now they hate that person and they hate themselves for it. And we see this all the time. Verse 16, but she said to him, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Now, this is hard for us to understand in this society, uh, in this modern culture. Uh, but back then, the shame by sending her away was even worse than what he did previously. How so? How does that mean? Well, when you violate someone at such a degree, it was that person's responsibility to take care of that woman because she had been defiled. She had been raped. And now no person, no culture, no family would want to have anything to do with that person. And so the Bible makes stipulations for such a terrible thing. The culture at this time in the Middle East made stipulations for such a, a thing. And it was that person's responsibility to take care of that person for the rest of their lives. But by sending her away, it's like pouring salt upon a very open wound. It's by heaping more and more shame. And Tamar recognizes this, knowing God's word, knowing the culture, and yet Amnon doesn't even care. Doesn't even care. And we realize the depths of his love is really just sexual gratification. And he called the young man, verse 17, who served him and said, put this woman out of my presence 
and bolt the door after her. You know, in the original Hebrew, it's even worse than that because it doesn't say woman. It says, but put this out. Put the, wouldn't even use her as a real person, just degrading her even further. Put this out. Verse 18, now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore, and she laid her hand on her head and went away crying as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, has Amnon, so of course Absalom being her full brother, has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. So we don't entirely know the motivations of why he says these things. Uh, We can come up with possibly two. And I'm going to throw them out to you. Uh, the first one is we know what's going to happen in the next couple of verses, and we're going to talk about it next week. He's going to get revenge. So he's saying, hey, don't let this bother you. I'm going to take care of it. You know, Don't let this worry you. Hold your peace. Don't rock the boat. I'm going to take care of it, which is probably what many of us would think and do. We're going to take care of it. But then I also think, especially coming in light of the very next verse that we read. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. But that's it. That's it. And it makes me wonder, did Absalom say these things because he thought maybe his own dad would bring some justice? Maybe his own dad would handle this in an appropriate sort of way. And we know from the text, he doesn't. And years passed. And I don't want to give away too much of what we're going to talk about next week. But David doesn't do anything about it. You know, it says that he gets angry, but that's it. And we see from other passages like 1 Kings, or sorry, uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, that even with his own other sons, like Adonijah, he doesn't discipline them. He doesn't take care of them. He doesn't give them direction. He fails to punish sin within his house. Verse 22, but Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, but Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. What do we see? The sin, it multiplies, it snowballs, it begets more sin. Sin spreads when sin isn't Addressed. And what do we see Amnon commit? He commits loads of sins. He lusts, he covets, he has deceit, he rapes, he commits incest, he abuses her, and he has hatred for her. Just multiplying over and over again the sin. And what we see is that sin brings suffering to all those that are affected. And eventually it brings destruction. You know, I'm reminded of that very famous uh, English uh, theologian, John Owen. He used to be the vice chancellor in the 1600s of Oxford. You're probably good friends with him, uh, right? Yeah, you you know. Uh, And so uh, he has this very famous uh, saying that uh, we have to kill sin or sin will be killing you. And he wrote this incredible book called The Mortification of uh, Sin. And his whole idea, and if you even look at his portrait, he looks like he's up to no good. Um, but he says, you've got to kill sin or sin is going to kill you. And he likens it onto a forest, a wood. And it's not like it is today when we go to a forest, we think how beautiful it is and how amazing it is. Uh, for people living in the 1600s, this was a place that was unsettled. This was a place that was uncivilized. And he said that the very heart of our souls is like a forest that needs to be cleared. Why? Because sin keeps cropping up, and we got to crop up. You know, right now there's loads of fires going on in California. And it seems like every year there's loads of fires going on in California uh, because of all of the brush and all of uh, the, the... the, the uh, debris. And I remember when I worked there um, at a Christian camp uh, when I was 20, one of the very first things that they asked us to do was we had to clear off uh, at least by 10 feet 
from every single building, all of the pine needles, uh, the, the leaves, uh, all of the stuff that collects around uh, the, the, any building. And the idea behind that was it was a preventative nature just in case there was a fire. So then these buildings wouldn't burn up. And we had to spend days just clearing off all of this debris, all of this stuff. Well, what do you have to do next year? You have to do that all over again because it just naturally just piles up. And we think about this idea of one little spark can set off a massive flame, can set off a massive fire and just commit so much destruction in its wake. And we think of that very same thing, even on our own lives, the very sin that we dwell on, these sinful desires that are fueled by sinful counsel will explode eventually into sinful actions. Now, how do you deal with your sin? Do you kill it or do you entertain it? You know, what forests or woods of sinfulness do you need to clear or remove today that you've been playing around with, but you know one spark could take you someplace that you never thought you would go. You know, we open this whole thing today with this idea of sin. It will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. You know, I think of that very same idea of coveting. It will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. You know, drinking and drugs will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. You know, gossiping will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You know, stealing will, will take you farther than you want to go. You know, entertaining sexual inappropriateness will take you farther than you want to go keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. What will be that thing today in your life that will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay? What will be that thing? If you could bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to have a moment now to ourselves between us and God between our very hearts and before the Lord of all creation, this is our opportunity as followers of him. This is our opportunity as people sitting in this room to do some real spiritual business with him. Are there things that we need to clear out? We just read a horrible example in the Old Testament about what happens when you don't kill sin in your life. Are there things in your life that you need to remove? Are there things in your life that you need to get rid of? This is your opportunity. I'm going to give you a few moments, and then I'm going to close in prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now very humbly, knowing our very own weakness, our very own uh, sinful nature, knowing that our bent is to go a direction far from you and to serve self instead of serving you. And I pray through the power of your spirit, through the obedience of your word, that you would please help us as a people, help us as uh, believers, that we can give our lives wholly to you, disregarding sin, leaving it behind, not listening to that counsel that would lead us astray, but that we'd live our lives in such a way that every thought, every action, every word that we have will be in subjection to your word and that would be for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we'd be not like Amnon. I pray that we would not entertain those sinful desires and passions. I pray that we'd be not like Jonadab, who instead of giving proper, wise, biblical counsel to a a needed friend, 
we, we aren't that person that would do the wrong and share the wicked and share evil um, plans or schemes. Lord, I pray that we'd be an example for the right thing to do with those around us. Lord, I pray that you would just please help us now as we continue with our worship when we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final song.
Amen. Amen. What a rousing, rousing anthem that song is. Um, so we've come to um, the end um, of our service. So I just want to give um, a few uh, f- uh, notices, um, starting off with our giving. Um, so as, you, as a church body, um, if you are a member of this church, um, then please, um, as part of your worship, please do give to the church. Um, it is one of those things that we do encourage um, as part of our core values. Um, and um, the easiest way to do it is, if you want to, you can put cash inside this black box over here. Or you can go on the church's website and find our bank details um, there. Um, And just another notice on the finances. As part of camp, um, as we kind of do say um, regularly that the money that we do give, that people, that all of you do give to the church does go back into everything that we do. Um, and even after all the payments from all the parents for um, church camp this year, it did cost the church um, about £5,000. So knowing that we are going to do it again next year, it would be good um, that we can start giving now so we don't have to take it out of the church's um, savings account. So yeah, please um, pray upon that. Um, and you know, Give in a cheerful way as, as the scripture um, commands all of us to do. Not under um, any compulsion, but anything that you want to cheerfully give, please feel free um, to give. Um, and then next, um, as uh, for this summer, um, as I said um, at the beginning of the service, the teens and everything um, is their final uh, lesson this year. Um, but yeah, everything in terms of the church activities, adventures club, um, small groups, um, everything like that is all off now. We're all on a, a summer break um, so everyone can get themselves refreshed, take a, take a bit of a break, still come on Sundays so you can still get the word. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the midweek activities, um, we're all on a summer break. And then next Sunday, um, we do have our communion service. This is something that we practice on a regular uh, basis. And this is where we come um, to the Lord's table um, and take of the bread, take of the wine in fellowship and in unity with one another as the Lord commands. So that's on Sunday, um, the 4th of August, so next Sunday. So please um, prepare your hearts um, during the week um, and work things out, you know, privately with the Lord as you prepare your hearts for that. Um, So yeah, that's the final notice. Uh, Thank you for coming. Um, We're going to break for tea and coffee. Um, God bless you and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you.